So my name is Brian Arthur. This is Study 15 in the New Creation Teaching Ministry Summer School. This morning, um, the three of us that are speaking uh, have been given uh, one of the commandments each to speak on. I come from the, or with the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Our Lord put it this way, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. And that's where our study title comes from. Luther said that the misuse of God's name is the greatest sin that can be outwardly committed. I thought, mm, that's a big statement. And he obviously understood something more about the name and keeping it holy than I did when I started in this study and maybe many of us. So whatever is meant by not taking the Lord's name in vain has just got to be a lot bigger than stopping swearing or taking some kind of oath using the Lord's name uh, in the wrong way. It's got to be a lot bigger than that. Likewise, honouring God's name must mean more than simply tacking it on to the end of prayers and in our liturgy. As an incantation. Did you know there are no incantations in the scripture? Because God's given us himself. And have to bring him up. I can remember one of the deadliest subjects in systematic theology in college was the names of God. What on earth did he have all those names for? It just got complicated and you analysed it and you tried to work it all out. And what we do is we end up with reductionism about this issue in particular, I think. We reduce keeping the Lord's name from vanity in sort of uh, going around reminding people when they say, oh my God, that they mustn't say that. Reductionism is taking the mystery of God's loving and his holiness and the wonder and the extent of the intrusion of himself into our world in his name and turning it into a mechanical thing. Reductionism takes that which is relational and turns it into propositions. So you study the names of God as some kind of Hebrew word. Keep God's name holy. We need just perhaps before we get into the substance of it, just to underscore what we mean when we say the word keep. We, there's a way in which we can grab that and run with it as if we are God. And we'll give him, an, we'll give him a hand to keep his name polished. And we may even be able to give him a hand to make his name more relevant or even perhaps more holy in practical terms. It's not, what we, it's not the way we're going to use that word. When Mary saw, began to see the ministry of Jesus, it's recorded that she kept those things in her heart. In other words, she treasured them. And that treasuring was not just a, ooh, ah, this is my son. It was a treasuring that began to move her, to migrate her into trust in the Messiah. So that's how we'd want to use that. Keep God's name holy. 
is not a, an invitation to uh, attempt to add to that holiness or to polish it or whatever else. The issue of honouring God's name in our culture is a hot potato. It really came home to me strongly uh, in that final Q&A program last year, some of you would have seen it, in which the Archbishop of Sydney was absolutely clobbered on national television in your face by the lady sitting next door to him, calling him all the names under the sun. Every, everybody on the panel entered into that in some way or another. But she kind of focused. And uh, as you do, you think, heck, what's going to happen next? What would I have done in that situation? And I think there's a disquiet. I spoke um, up the Riverland not so long ago about this issue. And uh, after church, we sat for half an hour and talked. And the young ones came and said, we're at university and we're not quite sure in the face of belligerent atheism, in the face of uh, new religions that are surfacing in our country, whose passion and intensity takes the honouring of God to violence and confrontation. We, we're not sure. What, how do we do it? It's a big question. It's not the topic that we're on today, but it has to do, I think, much more with the suffering uh, for Christ and the gospel than we thought. On that night on Q&A, um, the Archbishop, Archbishop Jensen... I can always remember Geoffrey uh, saying some, something like this. Um, when you're in the middle of the thick of it, smile at them. <laughs> hmm. I thought, how corny is that? <laughs> but it's true. And, and Archbishop Jensen loved them all and smiled at them. <laughs> and it was beautiful. And the world could see, at least in part, what was going on. Hmm. So, do we outsmart them? He didn't come back with a smart aleck comment. And he didn't outshout it. And in a sense, he didn't just go quiet. But he loved her. So what does it look like to defend the honour of God? Hmm. Young Timothy, I guess, was to find out that when you preach the gospel, people think you're obscene and it's an obscenity. And uh, uh, we, we're in that stream. I thought to myself on that night, because what permeated or what... Or what um, brought the anger in the group, in the Q&A panel to the pitch was really a peripheral Christian issue. I think it was to do with marriage or with uh, husbands, wives submitting to their husbands or something. Um, I thought to myself, if Archbishop Jensen had said, Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father, what would have happened then? Hmm. And that's where we are in our culture. How do we say that? What do we do if we're killed for that? He, he, was, he died on public television. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, so the issues that are on the table this morning with this particular um, study is the command to honour God and what's in his name, what's in a name. Those are the two issues that I want to, to focus on. And in looking at the second issue, what's in a name, I'm hoping that as we see the wonder of that name, the issue of what it means to profane that name, uh, you'll be clear about. 
uh, the, the commentators are not clear what it really means to take the name of the Lord in vain. Mm, they argued about it. Commanded to honour God, commanded to praise God, commanded to worship, sounds like, if we're not careful, say sorry. You know the futility of telling your kid to say sorry. Hmm. Or telling you to say sorry. The demand, the command of God to praise him, to honour him, drove C.S. Lewis nuts. Come to that later on. Was God just looking for some kind of respect for his office? Was he looking for, is he looking for self-indulgent compliment? Is he on some kind of megalomaniacal trip? You and I commanded to be honoured, that's what we would say of one another. Is he just setting up some kind of religious structure so that we can give him a nod and then feel good? We know that none of those things are true, but they are the, they are the things that, that focus largely in the world's mind when they hear a command like this. And then he goes and makes it all worse and puts a big stick on the end of it. He says, if you don't do it, I'll get you. Or does he? What made these particular images that I've just described, our, re our reaction to that command, what made that completely wrong in Israel's situation? And the answer has to be that when God spoke these words to Israel, he had placed her in a state of grace. He'd saved her, he'd kept her, he'd loved her, he'd lured her, he was with her. They tasted his glory, they'd, they'd felt the waterfall of his goodness and his glory and his goodness are always connected. So the grace in this command was transformative <laughs> for Israel to hear it. It was the law of delight not to take the name of the one that had come to you and done all of this and, and established you with him in the world that you were currently living in. It was not a great burden to not take that name in vain. Too many negatives there, but you get the point. Their glorifying God and their joy and their fullness had all come together because God had, had placed them under his waterfall of loving and blessed them out of their socks. So they tasted the banquet of the positive side of what it means for a human being to honour God, be honoured by God and respond and honour God. And they were enjoying him and that's why the, the negative law, don't take my name in vain or else, wouldn't have been at all interpreted as I had initially explained. So to profane their saviour would have been to ignore his mercy. In the presence of the waterfall, it would have been to cry out, where's my bucket? That I can go to my well and I can get my dribble and I can put it in the bottom of my bucket and I can look at my bucket and I can show you my bucket and if you're good, I'll give you a drop out of my bucket and we'll live together 
with our buckets. And all the time the waterfall is going <laughs> That's profanity. And in that waterfall, we begin to see the logic of loving that says, if you don't honour my name, there'll be consequences. <laughs> You'll have to live with your bucket. And it's empty. And no matter how many idols you stick in it, it'll be empty, because they're empty. <laughs> and if I let you stay with your empty bucket, and you didn't feel the emptiness of that bucket coming into your belly and into your spirit and drying you up and putting you in the middle of a salt pan, if you didn't feel that, you would never, ever again want to come to the waterfall. <laughs> Can you see the difference that grace makes in understanding the command? Hmm. So what's in a name? There's a lot, actually. Even, I was thinking, and, and probably what I'm about to say, I'd, I'd kind of put a question mark about, with us in our West, names are not all that strong. Until you misspell my name, <laughs> then it becomes an issue. So they're not just labels and tags, but probably they're not much more for a lot of us. I spent two years uh, not having a name, but having a number. I wasn't in jail, um, <laughs> kind of, but, uh, uh, and it was really good to get out of the army and get your name back. Hmm. So it's good to have a name, uh, but certainly in the scriptures, and certainly when it comes to the name of God, the scriptures look at it far differently. I want to look at three examples of that, and then we'll come on to the... To the uh, the pinnacle of all of that in Christ looking and honouring his Father's name and bringing us into that. When God revealed himself to Moses, we've looked at this briefly on a couple of other occasions, but we'll go it again. When God revealed his glory to Moses, he did three things. He walked by, so we've got presence. He gave Moses his name and then he does something which he continues to do all through history. He gave Moses handles about his name. He explained his name that not only extended his presence into Moses' life, but it gave Moses the connections with the living God by which he could call upon him. Let's look at that verse. Moses said, I pray, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. So we've got his name on the table. We've got his goodness on the table. We've got his presence on the table. We've got his glory on the table. I will make my all my goodness, the waterfall, not a bucketful, all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I show compassion. So this is the point we want to get through. In sharing his name with Moses, God was actually extending his presence into the world of Moses' life. Joining himself with Moses 
and Moses' world. And in that joining, in that name giving, he was inviting Moses to respond. But that wasn't all. He didn't simply share a formal name with Moses, but he extended himself by defining his name, slow to anger, abounding in covenant mercy. And Moses had some, some connection as the leader of the people before whom he'd just broken the law, the tablets of the law in front of them in, in the light of their rebellion. And the overwhelming presence of God and the attachment to that name of, of connective points with what Moses was dealing with gave him that mercy not just to stand as a man, as a leader, but to go down the mountain and face the people with the name of God and give them that same mercy of the point of attachment. This is what the name of God is all about. It is not some uh, formal tag it is him coming, extending his presence and joining himself in that way to our will. It's all about intimacy and access. And Moses didn't have a chance to give God a name. <laughs> hmm. That was a mercy. And God's goodness was present as powerful, overwhelming grace. And Moses called upon the name of God. And as he called upon it, he was surrounded and baptized into all that name stood for and was in his presence. And this was the gift that he could bring down the mountain. Not just, I know the name of God, but God named himself, explained himself, came himself, and here he is. The same principle stood in the Old Testament when it came to the hope of Messiah. His name, as recorded in the Old Testament, is God promising to extend himself into a sinful world so that that sinful world would have attachments so they could call upon him. So the prophet said, a child will be born to us. A child will be born to us. There's an attachment. There's a presence. A son will be given. He knows something that we don't know about the father. And the government will rest on his shoulders so that in every situation my poor people who are overwhelmed and suppressed and pushed down know that they have the living God with them and they call upon him as their governor. Not just the sovereign one. That, that word sovereign gets abused and probably has a lot of unhelpful connotations sometimes. Maybe, as already been described, maybe a better word is free. He's the free ruler. And can you see how the extension of that name in Messiah was going to do what God did when he went past Moses behind the rock? And it was going to, to, to be the sacrament of bringing himself with the ability for Moses to, to relate to him and to call out to him and call upon him. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Each description is the logic of love. 
the attachment of love between a loving God and people of his who are struggling and, and, and being pressed down. It's the waterfall of his goodness. It's the logic behind all of our honouring of him. And it's the logic of what the psalmist said, all my springs are in him, not the bucket. I think I'll leave the last illustration. Uh, it, talks to, it has to do about uh, the naming of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. <laughs> Same principle, God extending himself. But to be baptised into the name of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit is not a ritual, an incantation or a magic thing. It is to have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come and extend not just themselves, but their holy ambition for you and the world into your life for your good and for your glory. But more as they come by name, they extend their presence into every situation that you'll ever find yourself in. And in that situation, they explain themselves by name that your heart may go and hold that in the depths of the suffering or whatever you're in. So to profane the name is to cry, where is my bucket? Not where is my waterfall? So can you see? that by commanding us to honour his name, God is actually resetting us into the only location where we will be filled. And in that filling, or rather that filling will overflow into honouring and guarding against dishonouring. It's a wonderful thing for God to command us to honour his name. Lewis, C.S. Lewis, talked about it in these terms. True glorification of another must come from a true experienced delight in the fullness of the other. I've got a grandson called Luca. And the other day I told him off. He's, he's three. And he didn't handle it well. Uh, he's a sensitive little boy, and I probably... Uh, anyway. Um, I'm not confessing that one. Um, and he burst into tears and out of the room. A little while later... Um, his mother and he left the place and he said, say goodbye to Grandpa. Silence. Face like three kicks on a mud wall. <laughs> say goodbye to Grandpa. This is a three-year-old. And within a second, Grandma was in the other room. He says, bye, Grandma. Grandma was where all of the delight was. Mm. And Lewis said, the most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything, strangely escaped me. I thought of it in terms of compliment, of approval. I'd never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows in honour and praise, unless sometimes we bring shyness in to check it. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses, readers their favourite poets, walkers the countryside, players praising their favourite games, praise of the weather, wine, dishes, actors, horses, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians and scholars. And he said, I think we delight to praise 
what we enjoy because the joy is not complete until it's expressed. It's not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until it's expressed. So God comes with liberty and the liberality of knowing his name and fills our destiny. But the prime example, and I want to come to this quickly, is Jesus of Nazareth. He's the prime example of God revealing his name and extending the consequences of all that he is in that name to the human heart for its joy. He comes and like with Moses, cracks open every other false name by which sinners live as dead men walking. And Jesus extends the Father's name into our idolatry and he cracks open the hearts which proudly profane the name of their creator by just ignoring him. And he cracked open the hearts which would trust in anything but the Father. And he encapsulated his whole ministry in terms of his Father's name. I didn't ever understand what that meant, I think. Just read John. We haven't got time to go through it all. But he said, I've come in my Father's name. In other words, he came saying, I know how my Father is extending himself to me when he calls me son. And I know the connection points that he's making in my heart as a human being when he calls me son. So that in every situation, I can go, Father. And the waterfall never stops. And the bucket brigade is never a question. That's, in the end, what he delivers to us. There's a beautiful verse in 17, John 17, 6, that says, I've manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. I want you to imagine for a moment that giving, that moment when the Father gives you to the Son. In terms of me, he's giving some kind of schizoid rebel. Now I'm a rag doll of sloth and indifference and I'll name anything as my God. And then I'm some kind of arced up zealot and I'm angry and I've got a thousand broken buckets. And he gives me to his father. Or rather, no, his father gives me to his son. I had no idea that was happening. But it did. And everything in the son filled him with, in this great exchange, with great hope, so that he's able to draw in the sloth and he's able to neutralise the zealot and he's able to hold me with all my buckets in array, disarray, and he's holding me in a no-bucket cross and a no-bucket tomb. And you wake up to the waterfall. 